speculation at the time, and there still is a lot of speculation that there may have been others involved in some of those murders. Gacy always said he didn't kill all the boys, and he alluded to the idea that there could have been a bigger picture, that there may have been a snuff film operation, and that some of these young men and boys were being killed and videotaped, and the videos sold on the black market. He didn't give me names, he didn't say he was involved, he didn't tell me who was involved, but he alluded to that. When he first said that to me, I mean, I was thinking, this sounds like a bunch of BS. And then I thought about it and I thought, well, Gacy liked to make money. There were probably other people involved in these crimes. There was probably a black market for snuff films back then, if you like that kind of stuff. So maybe that did make sense. The thing of it is, they want you to believe that uh, I and I alone committed these, these murders. And, and I had nothing to do with the murders of anyone. If anybody was involved, then how many people uh, are we talking about beside yourself? We believe there was four people involved. Mm -hmm. And that would be uh, Michael Rossi, David Cram, uh, Philip Paskey. Both Rossi and Cram denied any knowledge of Gacy's murders or of any of their involvement in anything. Phil Paskey was from Chicago. He, you know, he was one of those people who got into trouble, didn't, you know, did a little drugs, did a little of this. And somehow John Norman came into his life. So the story goes like this. There's a guy named John Norman. Norman does some jail time for assaulting some kids in Homewood, Illinois. While he's in the Cook County Jail using the jail printing press, he creates this newsletter, the Delta Project, this sex trafficking ring that's going to men who want to have sex with boys. And while he was in Cook County Jail, he met Phil Paskey. And when he got out of jail, Cook County Jail, Paskey took over the operation of Norman's operation. Here we, we've got a, a Philip Paskey who had a, a newsletter going out of the Cook County Jail. And, and here he is involved with a guy named John Norman. And John Norman was uh, running uh, Boys for Hire. They were making snuff films with young boys. To me, they were pimping them off. They were selling them. So the connection is this. John Norman, running the Delta Project sex trafficking ring, has an assistant named Phil Paskey. And guess what? Phil Paskey works for John Wayne Gacy. In 1977, the Judiciary Committee of the United States Senate put together a subcommittee to investigate the problem of child sex trafficking. Their first hearing was in Chicago. They called it a hub, uh, the center of the country's business in child sex trafficking. And yet, Nobody ever thought, hey, maybe we ought to look at that sex trafficking ring that was investigated by Congress in 1977 when you're investigating John Wayne Gacy in 1978. I, I guess you kind of got to ask yourself, what are the odds that Phil Paskey, who's John David Norman's right-hand man, is working a day or two here and there for Gacy? I can't believe that it wasn't some crossover. Gacy loved pornography. There's certainly evidence that if John wasn't making stag films, he was trying to. After John had been arrested, the police had gone through. There was a, a big dresser and something else that we had picked up and taken that wasn't ruined or destroyed. And when we got it home, underneath the drawers were some packets that were taped to the thing. Uh, I would think, if anything, police would have found those. It was just kind of weird. And they were some uh, pornographic pictures. It was John. It was like a three-person thing. I was shocked. And I put them back in the envelope. I don't know if I gave them to Sam Amaranti or if I gave them to a detective that came to the house. I said, I can't believe that these were not found. Not that John Wayne Gacy is a credible uh, witness here, but he says they ought to look into john norman and look at uh, his 
videos to see if they ident can identify any uh, victims and sort of implying that John Norman is involved in this. There, there was a crossover uh, when we checked into John Norman's background that he, he goes all the way back to uh, the early, uh, early 70s involved in, uh, he ran the Norman Foundation, he, he ran, ran Epic International and the Odyssey Foundation out of Dallas, Texas. And these were uh, organizations where wealthy men could uh, hire young boys for sexual, for sexual weekends. Male H prostitutes. Have you ever met Norman? Have you ever had any contact with Norman? I have yet to see a current picture of him, and and therefore I'd have to say no. Uh, I, you know, Phil Paskey may have been with him at one time or another because, see, again, I came home from out of town at times, and Phil Paskey would be at the house drinking beer or something like that. Uh, David Cram is the one that brought uh, Phil Paskey in, and because uh, Cram, when he wanted, he didn't want to do nothing. He got a hold of this guy and said, "Well, this guy can get you uh, somebody for sex." I mean, Gacy clearly knew who John Norman was, and his deflection, his his uh, lie was, "Oh, I, I don't think I know him. Do you have a picture?" John knows who his accomplices were. And somehow he's, like, protected them. So the fact that he's, he kind of threw P P Paskey out there is, like, suspicious. That was typical Gacy. Sort of like, don't look over here, look over there. So you never knew if he was telling the truth or he was really leading you somewhere that you should be going. You didn't know with him. I think Phil Paskey is the bridge here. He works for John Wayne Gacy, and he works for John Norman of the Delta Project sex trafficking ring. Is that a coincidence? If nothing else, it's worth looking into. I don't know that they ever looked into it at all. It, I just don't get that. So that contributes to this cloud of suspicion. You would think that as the generation passed, that someone would say, All right, it's time. It's time to get to the bottom of this. And I just don't see it happening. Wow. Holy cow. So did you hear all that they said there? That was very fascinating. Um, I'm learning this. This is completely brand new. I've never watched this before. But I just happened to see it on YouTube. And um, figure I'd throw it up here. So, again, but this is adding new insight. Okay. Because John Wayne Gacy was killing young men and burying them under his house. Um. John Wayne Casey was involved with this guy named Phil that worked for him. And this Philip guy met John Norman, this pornographer in jail, and actually took over his Odyssey Foundation, which is distributing this pornography, child pornography, around the country. All around the same time, right before the Atlanta child murders happened. Matter of fact, I believe Gacy was arrested at the end of 1978, and then what, within six months, all this was going on down in Atlanta. Now, you would think that Atlanta and Chicago are completely different worlds, and in some ways they are, but if you have a nationwide sex ring, and you got hundreds of thousands of clients, and you've got these little dorms set up that you can send these uh, travelers, what are they, uh, whatever Norman was calling them around the country. You could run it from Chicago or wherever Norman was at and cover the whole country. Okay? And just because Norman was taking videos and pictures of exploited children, he exploited doesn't mean he wasn't receiving material from other individuals 
and passing that around okay so if you think about it like in business or say the music business okay Wayne Williams was involved in the music business back then how it would have worked is Wayne Williams would have maybe gotten a local agent or he or he would have been the local agent got a record or two going and then somebody from Hollywood or New York a national agent would have heard about them come down listen to his tapes listen you know you heard about it on the radio or something like that and picked up a contract on those you know with Wayne Williams and his Genesis Gemini group and then did a national distribution of his music now if you take that and put it in the perverse with the exact same formula in the child pornography industry you're looking at Norman and maybe other people involved in nationwide that are picking up these local markets like what Wayne Williams is getting into so very fascinating again Norman is involved in child pornography he knows this guy that knows Gacy who's killing what 30 33 kids 33 teenage boys and burying him under his house okay maybe and that lady just said right off the top there that maybe some of them were killed in snuff films this is exactly my pretense my synopsis my idea whatever you want to call it of what was happening with the Atlanta child murders that that's what I think was going on that this whole Nova Entertainment, Omega Entertainment, Southern Media was all a front, okay, to get these kids in, to get them to audition, to get photos, to get their information, to get a portfolio to pass out among their clients, and then he could worm his way into grooming them and get them in to take pictures of them that's just my synopsis again I'm going by the actions of Wayne Williams okay as soon as he was questioned that night on the 22nd or that morning of the 22nd he immediately went home and started burning stuff in the backyard his dad said it was just old photos out of focus photos what a high coincidence there okay so something's going on here um i think that wayne williams was on the cusp of either did plug in with norman or another group maybe through james Comento, of child pornography that's like that's where i think it centers because you had that group at the alamo hotel right across from where the close to the pool where um, Terrell went swimming and they were busted and they had all that pornography all these things come to a head right at right before Wayne Williams right before right at the same time Wayne Williams is caught you get Thevis he kills his partner after he escaped from prison then he gets caught all his stuff is liquidated and he goes to trial and goes to prison you got these uh, child pornographers who are all arrested right around the same time as Wayne Williams either right before right during or right after and some are even convicted I think one was even convicted on the day that Wayne Williams got stopped on the bridge or got stopped from going across the bridge either the 21st or the 22nd of May I'm gonna get believe me I'm gonna get more into those guys later on but all these guys are connected Remember I told you about this stripper network that I was to- talking about. Um, that you had regional guys that owned certain clubs, strip clubs in Georgia, in New York, in Oregon. But they had their girls on this circuit, okay? And they would travel from they'd be in Oregon for a couple months and they'd travel down to Georgia and they'd strip in the various clubs there for a couple of months 
They even had a house set up for them. This is what my stripper client that I was driving in the taxi was telling me. And 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 I, I've heard this before because when you look back when I was doing the JFK assassination videos, I'm still doing those. When you check out Ruby, that's exactly what Ruby was doing. Ruby had some clubs in Dallas. He had gone to New Orleans. This is where he picks up Jada and was looking for new strippers to come to hit, come to Dallas and work for him for a couple of months, you know. And that's what they did. People got tired of seeing, you know, these guys who come in, you know, I hate to say it, they got tired of seeing the same boobies jiggling around. So he had to go out and get, they called it fresh flesh. So Ruby would go to Oklahoma City. He'd go down to Houston. He'd go to New Orleans. He'd go over to San Antonio and Austin and bring those strippers up to where he was at in Dallas. And they'd be there for six months or a year, and then they'd, you know, somebody from Chicago would come get them, and they'd go up to Chicago or they'd go over to New York. And this is the same kind of network we're talking about. I guess you could call it a flesh network that's involved in the more illegal aspects of, you know, when you get into child porn and stuff like that. But there had to be, you think about it, this guy, Norman, kept getting arrested. We're going to go over arrest after arrest after arrest after jail time after parole after jail time all the way until his 80s. So there had to be some incentive to say, I'm going to keep getting in into this regardless of the risk. Um, maybe there's a lot of money in it, and it was worth the jail time, worth the downtime he'd have to face. Anyway, that's just one Alright, so this is uh, CavDev. I'm not, it's sort of like I don't know the dark pages of Wikipedia. It looks just like Wikipedia but it has a lot of controversial stuff. Um, they mention in here the Odyssey Foundation, the Delta Project, Handy Andy. Uh, they also mention the Franklin, I, I, again, I'm learning as I go along. This is the Franklin sex scandal. Um, it says, in June 1978, Chicago police officers seized tens of thousands of pink index cards from Norman's apartment, which were the records of Norman's customers. Each file contained the customer's name and their sexual preference regarding the boys Norman was prostituting. During an interview by Ted Gunderson, Franklin victim um, Paul Bona Bonacci mentioned being abused by a Chicago school teacher named Joe Reynolds who procured children for a nationwide boys prostitution network. The man in Chicago who ran the child prostitution ring kept pink collection of file cards um, listing customers and kinds of boys they like. When the man who had a history of sex offenses against children was once again arrested on child molestation charges, law enforcement discovered his file cards. Bonnet Bonacci uh, recounted being in the apartment where the file cards were kept, performing administrative tasks for the network. According to Bonacci, two names that showed up in the file cards were Alan Bear and Harold Anderson both implicated in the Franklin case as homosexual pedophiles based on the location of Chicago, the timing of Bonacci's abuse, late 70s and early 80s, the description of the man in charge of the network and the nature of the file cards, their color, and information they contain is extremely likely the man was John Norman. That would indicate multiple Franklin abuse boys um, from Norman's operation. And we're going to go into this Franklin's child sex ring. I I've never heard of this, but here we go. It says the Franklin Child Sex Ring was politically connected child prostitution ring in, o in Omaha during the 80s. Children from all over Omaha, including the Boys Town Orphanage and uh, Nebraska Foster Care System, were kidnapped to be abused at sex parties. Republican power brokers Lawrence E. King operated and hosted these um, sex parties which were attended by political and business elites in Omaha. 
He also flew the children around the country, particularly to Washington, D.C., to be abused by other rich and powerful men. The main purpose of King's pedophile ring was blackmailing politicians, government officials, businessmen, and um, media figures with proof of them having sexually abused children. So, again, that's what I was alluding to um, about, you know, um, Andrew, Ye not Andrew Young, uh, Mayor Jackson. And how one of the boys that was murdered had a key that was found on him to a hotel room where Mayor Jackson had stayed previously within the last couple of days. So that could be one of the reasons why the investigation wasn't opened up on the, on the 28 children or the other 28 victims, mostly children. And, you know, this sounds eerily almost exactly like Jeffrey Epstein's um, network that he had going. You know, Epstein Island and all that stuff. And, you know, you got to be crazy to think that if Jeffrey Epstein was bringing all those politicians to that island and there were all these teenage girls running around that island half naked that there weren't cameras recording everything and that he was using that and that's why he didn't get caught or prosecuted or he got a slap on the wrist when he finally got prosecuted what or got arrested what 15 years ago so that could be what's going on there also and again like I said it goes across, it's apolitical, it goes across all networks. This is what I hate about this QAnon thing and Trump saying now is that it's just just the Democrats. It's bullshit. That's the Republicans, Democrats, all politicians involved, okay? And then it goes on, let's see, uh, Craig Spence. I don't know, I don't know who any of these people are or what any of this is about, but we will definitely read on with this here. This is absolutely brand new. Commonwealth savings in 1980s under the governorship of Bob Kerry. Commonwealth savings collapsed. Kerry and his backers appeared to have deliberately caused the collapse of Commonwealth in order to plunder it, turning a profit in the wake of the fallout. Many of the same officials covered up the corruption of Commonwealth. Uh, let's see... Uh death to Charlie Rogers so this is a list of people that were involved with this Franklin network um, there's a police chief there there's a judge there's a mayor of Omaha president of a university system um, director in Boys Town. Here's Washington, D.C. They're saying that George Bush was involved. I've heard this many times. Dick Thornburg. Um, Jack Kemp. Wow. But, you know, people throw around all kinds of accusations. Doesn't mean they're involved. Uh, Barney Frank, there's Des Moines, a Hollywood producer. Of course, there's all these things about what's going on. There's Michael Aquino. He's the head of that Church of Satan or whatever that was. Um, let's see. Dun, dun, dun. Of course, anybody can name anyone without any kind of proof whatsoever. Now, this is interesting. Willie Thyssen, owner of Godfather's Pizza. Now, I thought that Godfather's Pizza was owned by this black guy from Atlanta. I can't remember his name. I think he just died recently of uh, COVID. Let's see here. But you see, there, there's another network 
so the the networks will change names sometimes they'll change um, addresses they'll change client lists but a lot of the clients remain the same and again if you think about Atlanta you've got this international busiest airport in the country people flying in there's all these hotels downtown all these hotels all around Atlanta so that would be the perfect place if you had a pedophile that was exploiting children taking photos they could fly in hook up with them do whatever you know There's Roy Coyne. He ran a pedophile ring. Now, if I remember correctly, wasn't Trump, uh, wasn't his mentor a guy named Roy Coyne? If I remember correctly. All right, let's see what else. Yeah, there was the D.C., Cowboy ring. See what happens is these networks, they get really big. They exploit children. They blackmail politicians. And then maybe someone gets caught. Some people take the rap and go to jail. The other ones lay low for a while. And then they restart someplace else in the country. And then it all starts over again. Just exactly like Norman was doing. I mean, you think about it. How could Norman keep getting away with this for 20, 30 years and get a slap on the wrist and get let go or get, you know, escape on bail and no one look for him? Maybe he had some connections with some people. Who knows? Uh, let's see. I'm not seeing the connections to Atlanta. Of course, all this gets into Q9 territory now. North Fox Island pedophile ring. Let's take a look at that one. See, they're mentioning the Atlanta child murders right there. There's one right there, Valdosta sex ring allegations. So here's one, Washington, D.C. Uh, cowboy ring. Um, let's see if we can get some dates on this one. Yeah, back in the 80s. I think I remember this one. Of course, a lot of these rings, these prostitution rings like this, when it is involving, like, politicians, it's all about blackmail, okay? We want you to vote this way or vote yes or no against whatever bill it is and if you don't then the media is going to get some photos of you and that 14 year old boy or whatever that's how these things work okay again I can see how this could work that way in Atlanta with Wayne Williams. Maybe he was providing the pornography. Maybe they were other people were providing the children to people that would fly in. Yeah, this one's interesting because he talks about Roy Cohn and how. Roger Stone and him were, they knew each other, and Roger Stone and Roy Cohn was like a mentor, a mob mentor to Trump. Basically, 
you know, the mob controlled the unions in uh, the construction unions in New York. And if you didn't give them a little piece of the action, that means they're due, you wouldn't have anybody working on your damn buildings. They controlled the concrete unions, uh, the trucking, the construction. So you can't make any damn buildings without concrete, and the trucks are going to bring in all the equipment. So you're screwed. So you have to pay tribute to the mob in New York. That's how they get their money. They get a little bit off each building and Roy Cohn was Trump's connection to the mob and you know he laid the groundwork for him he smoothed the way like Trump learned from Roy Cohn to never ever ever do anything yourself to be legal you always get someone else to do it that's why he had Michael Cohen he had all these other people Paul Manafort that would do all these illegal things for him and Roger Stone was involved in this sex exploitation network and uh, matter of fact I think Roger Stone even worked on a campaign for like a, a madam for a prostitution ring I believe she was running as an independent in New York there for a while and then he jumped oh and let, let's not forget you remember um, Berkowitz the uh, what was that the shootings that occurred back in 76, 75, 76, these are the ones that I think that Wayne Williams was trying to emulate because, you know, this guy would come up with a 38, boom, 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 shoot couples making out in cars or hanging out in their cars. And then you had the Lover's Lane shootings just the very next summer or the very next winter, uh, January, February, March of 1977 right southwest of where Wayne Williams lives, right in his killing range right there where he was dumping bodies. And again, like I said, I think Wayne Williams, through his network of police that he was befriending and making the rounds, trying to find out you know, news and stuff like that when he was trying to be a stringer, started hearing the scuttlebutt that they were going to not try to arrest the guy. They were going to ambush this guy. So that's when Wayne Williams decided, okay, I'm not going to be doing that no more. And he stopped He stopped doing the shooting. Now, interestingly, there was another shooting almost exactly the same way about two years later, about two weeks before the first victim was found. And the first victim was actually shot in the, shot in the chest with a 22. okay? This person had been using 22s. Um, and like I said, this person had been using 22 ammunition that was pulled. They they thought it was a policeman because it was a low-grade ammunition like the police use at their their firing ranges for target practice. So somehow they figured there's either a policeman or someone who had access to the police firing range, and that the firing range for the uh, the city of Atlanta is right down there um, off Moreland Avenue just to the east of the Starlight Drive-In just east of where several of these kids disappeared and just north of the South River where several of them were dumped in the river right there. So that's just another interesting fact. Um, but yeah, Berkowitz mentioned once he went to prison, it was dismissed because they thought he was just trying to say he was crazy. Um, that supposedly there was some kind of child exploitation network in New York that he was involved in of wealthy people and they were killing children. He participated in some of these things. And, um, you know... Oh, and I saw this is really interesting. There's a certificate of business, fictitious name firm, um, for Desert Records from 1957, December 1957, with John David Norman, based out of Palm Springs. So, oh, actually, out of Hollywood, Hollywood, California. 
right there. But he he registered with the city of Palm Springs. So I find that interesting that he first thought of using a record label to cover his sexual exploitations that he was doing just the same way that Wayne Williams was using this um, you know Nova Entertainment for alright so this is an article from Monrovia California uh, the Daily News Post 6 November 1970 and it says Basically, San Gabriel, West Covina man indicted federal charges of uh, pornography. And this one's saying that this group of about 14 people, of which John David Norman was the main guy, um, controlled about 25% of the printed pornography in the California area there. Um, let's see. He had a company called Covina Publishing and uh, Hardcore Pornography, and also um, pornography involving minors. See, there was millions of dollars involved there. So this is the incentive why people are willing to take the risk and go to jail, is because they can make. A lot of money really quickly. All right, so he got convicted. We read in that Winky Pity article. He got convicted, I think, 1972 for about 18 months, served a year and a half, got out, moved to Dallas, changed his name, and then he gets arrested again within like six months of doing the same thing. Okay, and this is John. This is the police report. John David Norman. Let me. So they've got cursive, so I can't really read exactly because it's a bad copy and it's cursive. It basically, uh, in a conspiracy, he committed sodomy. Um, lots of pornography literature. Index files were seized. And that's just a summary of the charges there. And you can see this is August 15th, 1973. Here's some more. The prosecution report is from the DA. See, look, it was dismissed. So they dismissed the charges. And they let him go. Oh, they dismissed the sodomy and sex exploitation, but they convicted him on, I think, drug charges. Yeah, on August 14, 1973, Detective W. King of the Dallas Police Youth Division received information from a confidential informant that John David Norman was operating a homosexual ring at his apartment located at 3716 Cole Avenue, apartment 208. The informant also told Detective uh, King that John David Norman has a large number of files in his apartment which lists the names of out-of-town persons who were involved in committing acts of sodomy with friends of John Norman. Detective King uh, then obtained an implement search warrant from the municipal court um, and they executed the warrant there. They had it under surveillance. They went in. They arrested him. He located several boxes of index cards bearing the names of persons suspected of committing acts of sodomy with friends of John Mormon. Uh, let's see. All right, so this is a list of witnesses. So they got this guy, and they're summarizing what they can tell them. 
Uh, let's see. Dun dun dun. So this is a news article um, from, I guess, the Dallas newspaper from the same date, kind of summarizing that. It says, police uh, here said today that they had uncovered a nation nationwide homosexual procurement ring in a raid on an apartment on the city's north side. Last night's raid, a fi <laughs> files contain the names and addresses of 50,000 to 100,000 people around the country. This is only 1973, just, what, six years before Wayne Williams started doing his thing. Also seized were booklets containing the pictures and names of teenage boys and young adult males available through the ring for homosexual activities, they said. So that right there is exactly what I'm talking about that Wayne Williams is doing. That's a portfolio right there. It's a catalog, okay? So... This is what Wayne Williams is doing. He was having the kids come and audition. He'd take a photo of them. He'd get their name and address and phone number and their height and weight. And then he'd shop that around to his clients. The audition was just a scam. Everybody that, like the owner of the studio at Shadowland said, he didn't really take it any further than a two minute audition. We took photos of the children, took down their name, address and phone number and then let him go and then he was contacting them later okay and still using the prospect of getting involved in a record deal to exploit them okay so he like I said I think Wayne Williams taking these pictures putting in a catalog shopping it around with this network okay this nationwide pornography network Child Pornography Network. He was shopping the kids around. People that were interested, they'd send him money. He would send them photos. That's how he was making his money. He was on the lower end, though. I don't think he had reached the stage of um, a pimp, but who knows? Maybe this Tom Terrell was his uh, pimp. That was pimping. And of course, they're mentioning this um, homosexual torture murder ring that was in Houston. The guy killed 27 young boys there before he was finally killed by one of the boys. Here's the uh, John Paul Norman, 45 years old. He was released on $7,000 bond just for the narcotics they didn't charge him for the pornography it says charges of conspiracy to commit felony sodomy and country delinquency of a minor were filed tomorrow five other arrests those charges were dropped and then once they put him on bond he got on a bond he fled immediately and went to uh, Illinois It mentions that he was um, convicted in California. It talks about the Odyssey Foundation. And the police in Dallas had no idea about John Norman's Odyssey ring. Okay, his pornography ring that he had started back in California. Uh, let's see. Typewriter, booklets, names, addresses. The literature and stationery bore the name Epic International. According to police, teenagers met young men were called fellows, while homosexuals of whom they were procured uh, were referred to as sponsors. Good Lord. It 
See? So all that in one year. A little bit over a year. He got out of jail in California, moved to Dallas, and within a year, he's doing the exact same thing. Just crazy. So he gets out on bond in Dallas, and he flees immediately to Illinois. And within three or four months, he starts the whole thing again, does the same thing with children again, and he's arrested again. Now here, they send him to the Cook County Jail, and they have him working in the printing office in the Cook County Jail. And he starts a newsletter inside the Cook County Jail, and he's making $300,000 a year out of the Cook County Jail. When he's sent off to prison, this other guy, Pensk, takes over his Odyssey Foundation and is running his newsletter while it, while Norman is sitting in jail. Okay? Just craziness. Absolutely, in, absolute insanity that this guy should have gone to prison and never, they should have just thrown away the key and never let him out. But here's 56, 58 pages of his arrest and what happened? He's doing the exact same thing. He's just moving locations. He went by the name of Stephen Gorell, I guess is what it's saying here. Yeah, see? So, it's saying here, this is how he groomed them. He met the kids in the neighborhood, saw them at a restaurant, asked them if they needed a ride home, was going to give them a ride home, but took them to his apartment. We got him to his apartment and offered him a beer. Yeah, see, this guy, Charles Reeling, actually was... Associated, I believe they were saying with uh, uh, Gacy. And we'll just keep skimming through all these real quick. See, Wayne Williams seems to be a little smarter than this Norman guy. This Norman guy just goes out, picks up kids in parks and whatever, and then, you know, tricks them into taking them home with him, offering them beer and all these kinds of things. Well, Wayne Williams is a little bit more sophisticated. He was using this Nova Entertainment to get them, you know, using the dream to get the kids thinking that they are going to get involved in some kind of music business. And then from that, he offered the music business as the dream. And then he used that to groom them. And he only groomed the ones that his clients were interested in from his portfolio that he was using. So these are just report after report after report of other victims and you have some here that like this guy it was a father that found out about what happened to his son and he's reporting it it's just you know this guy John Norman's like I don't know like a pedophile central wherever he goes it sets up and he starts doing the same exact thing routine alright so these are FBI memos and this is about uh, this guy named Philip Paskey and huh 
So Philip Paskey was this guy who worked with John Wayne Gacy, which is even more frightening because John Wayne Gacy's killing right at the time of this FBI memo, but they don't focus on him. They focus on John David Norman and Philip Paskey. Now, Philip Paskey and Norman met each other in the Cook County Jail, and Norman's still in jail, I believe, up to this time, like 1977. And Philip Paskey had gotten out and took over. John Norman gave him, here, here's my contact list with my cards of people I know, and here's the, the kids, you know, we're using and stuff like that. So he let him handle it while he was in prison. And then when he got out, he took it back over again. So, uh, you know, you can see something like this with Michael Thevis. We're going to go over Michael Thevis, the big porn king out of Atlanta, who handled like 40% of the, of the pornography in the United States. And there's just, back in those days, you couldn't, it was very difficult if you're involved in the porn industry that some of the porn you were involved with, with wasn't child pornography it, because the criminal element involved you know Michael Thiefus was knocking off and having people kill his rivals okay matter of fact he killed his business partner because he was afraid he was gonna you know turn state evidence so he had him ambushed so he was involved in that criminal activity and there wasn't there wasn't a line between like regular adult pornography and child pornography so I'm sure that Michael Thevis was involved also in distributing uh, pornography and then when he went to jail in 1978 we're back to jail because he had escaped I'm sure there was somebody in Atlanta like this Philip Paskey in Chicago that took over the remnants, the rump pornography industry, whatever was left over, the clubs, the movie theaters, um, his warehouse, whatever, his distribution, there was somebody left over, I'm sure, from his associates that went in and took over what they could to write, reestablish it. Now, you know, uh, Thevis never got out of prison and actually died in prison. But to think that David or John David Norman and Phil Paskey and his little child pornography ring and Mike Thevis and his pornography ring and Wayne Williams and his little pornography ring wasn't somehow in connection, you know. In the same circles? I, I don't know. But this is actually pretty frightening because the FBI, they've got their eye on um, John Norman and Philip Paskey in 1976, and they don't catch uh, Wayne Gacy until 1978. So uh, let's see what they have to say here. Investigator for Cook County... See, the one reason the FBI would be involved is the interstate uh, mailing and the interstate transportation of, well, the interstate mailing of pornog child pornography across state lines and the interstate transportation of minors across state lines for illegal sexual activity. That's a federal crime there. So, um... It says investigators from Cook County State's Attorney's Office furnished the following information on 10-18-76, stating that the investigation conducted by this office indicates that Norman are running a business, the Delta Project, so you didn't even know about the Delta Project back then, Post Office Box 5034, Chicago, Illinois, which transports young males, minors, interstate to pay customers for prostitution, um, homosexual purposes. So, boom. They know exactly what's going on. Investigation also indicates some of the customers may be federal employees. See? Blank furnished copies of his investigation. 
it is recommended that a new 166 case be opened. I'm not sure what a 166 case is. Um, let's see here. So they've got his address. They open the file 11. Yeah. Okay, so this is more of the same Chicago files we were looking at earlier. Yeah, same stuff. All right, so this is an interesting one. I, I like these sheets here. They're from the Department of Justice. They put together kind of a rap sheet. Now, they have this all on computer now, but back then they had to call around and get the information from each district. So they got him here um, molesting a minor back in 1954. They had uh, some kind of investigation of him in Houston, 1956. Um, something in Los Angeles 1956 there's one in Sacramento 1956 um, here is Santa Ana California 1960 uh, trafficking some kind in Los Angeles crimes against children 1960 sex perversion in Los Angeles 1963 I mean it's just one after another after another. Um, you know, I don't know. The way I feel about this sometimes is that they should just take people like this. Don't even bother putting them in prison. Just take them out and shoot them in the back of the head. Because they're never going to change. They're always going to be a risk. You can never, ever, ever trust them. And they're sick. I mean, they're like a mentally ill here's 1965 Los Angeles uh, sex offender Sacramento California 1966 sex offense Sacramento 1966 67 69 70 sending obscene material 1971 Sodomy, 1973 in Dallas. So, and the same thing with this Paskey guy. I mean, all kinds of stuff. Attempted battery, 1971. Um, let's see what else we have here. criminal warrant, armed robbery, uh, murder, it says murder I think, there's a murder charge, 1976, but still, he gets out, and he's helping, not only is he helping Norman, he's helping Wayne uh, Gacy kill all those kids and bury them under the house, just craziness. So the FBI was really good at collecting this information because, you know, they have FBI offices in almost every major city. So what they, they have a liaison with the, you know, the FBI in Los Angeles has a liaison contact with the Los Angeles Police Department. So what they would do in the court system. So the FBI, say like in Chicago, would send out a memo to all the major cities and say, hey, can you check court records and with your contacts in the police department see if they've had any contact with this guy named so and so and they get they'd list all the aliases and then they would go out and check and then whatever they got they would type up in a memo and copy the documents and telex it back to Chicago or Washington DC whatever and this is how they compile all this information it takes a while but you know All right, 
so this one in 1976 they contacted the Dallas Police Department and this is what the police departments were talking to the uh, FBI guy in Dallas and he's reporting back advised that Norman's business consisted of publishing a small booklet wherein he included photographs of young males in the nude which he had access to utilizing a mailing list Norman would mail out literature regarding his business to various individuals located throughout the United States if any of the recipients of the literature informed Norman of an interest in his booklet Norman would then furnish a copy of the aforementioned booklet from the photographs contained in the booklet the interested party would select the young boys or boys thereafter Norman would make arrangements for the boy or boys to travel to the location of the interested party you see so Wayne Williams hadn't reached that stage yet he was only sending around his uh, photos to local uh, maybe a few interstate people that's what I think is going on this guy is big time nationwide just a few years before Wayne Williams okay but you can see they're using kind of the same techniques um, it makes sense to me that if Wayne Williams didn't know about Norman he had read about him or maybe had other people that were in contact with him like Comento you know and Norman after the 70s he keeps going on he keeps driving on into the 80s moving around doing exactly the same thing it's all the way up until the 90s before he's finally put away in California and never ever you know allowed to get out and see here's here's another one 1975 conspiracy to commit sodomy dismissed from Dallas so you know it's interesting they say they charge him with violation of the narcotics laws but all the charges involving children sodomy sex exploitation of children they just drop very interesting here's Los Angeles same thing $10 bail in 1962 for a warrant Wow See here's one here sex offender and it was discharged they just didn't really take it that serious back then okay unfortunately it's just charge after charge after charge this guy is like a fucking oh man God knows how many people's lives he destroyed all right let's see So I went through and put all these articles and databases that I found uh, in order. I was going to go through all of them, but it's no point because it's really, it's just the same thing everywhere. Okay. He picks up, moves to another town. I think he went to Pennsylvania um, after Chicago. Then he ends up in Denver and then he ends up in New York or was it New York? And then he goes to California it's the same thing repeating again and again and again and again so it doesn't make any sense to read through all these things I wish I had a website I could put all this up on um, but it's just the same thing again and again and it goes on for years and years and years and finally they they just put him in jail and don't let him out until he dies but actually they did let him out when he was like 80 something they let him out on probation in this small town 
And within six months, he was doing exactly the same thing, and they had to put him back in the hospital, or back in this, this jail. But that was in, like, 2009, when he was 80-something years old. So, again, not much more to say here. It's just the same thing again and again and again. Um, one thing that's interesting, though, that I came across, I'll mention this one, is there's another guy named John David Norman, but he was in Atlanta, and this is just recently, and he was the uh, the son of the mayor of Doraville, okay, and his name just happens to be um, John David Norman, <laughs> but it's not the same guy, because this is like 2012, he was the son of former mayor Jesse Norman, um, you know, definitely the guy's like 57 years old. And there was a video of him having sex with two German shepherds and child pornography. I mean, good Lord, what is wrong with people, okay? Um, it's just bizarre. Very, very, very disturbing and bizarre. Just happens to have the same name, almost exact same name, as this other guy but he was the son of the mayor of Doraville of the mayor of Doraville and this is like 2012 so I don't know folks there's a lot of crazy crap out there a lot of things going on again my whole point of this was to show you that there was a network out there of which John Norman David Norman was part of it but not all of it, because he, he had 100,000 people, clients, that he was working with. I'm sure there were other John David Normans all around the country since the 60s. You know, little John David Normans in New York, in Oregon, in California, in Florida, in Texas, in Georgia. Okay? And they all linked up they all knew each other or they come across each other and they you know they produced in their areas and then they would retail it sell it out to other distributors who would get it to a national level and so that's what I think was going on is that Wayne Williams was involved in this child pornography business with these children and then either the he was angry and he killed him, the children out of anger or maybe someone else killed the children and he deposited the bodies or maybe he killed them for these snuff films for the, you know, you heard, you heard this lady mention about John Wayne Gacy and the snuff films and, and Norman. So there's definitely a precedence out there for it. Do I have absolute evidence for that, not a lot. Matter of fact, not a lo not hardly anything. But there's little snippets of it. Like I said, he burnt all those photos in the backyard the same day he got stopped. Just within hours. Okay. One of the children was found with a key from the hotel that the same room that Maynard Jackson had been staying in a couple of days before. Again, why wasn't Wayne Williams ever charged with the murders of these children? Only the adults, the two adults. Could it be that in the process of discovery where the prosecution and the uh, police would have to give copies of all their investigations, all their witness testimony, everything, that it would come out about the pornography and, most importantly, the rich client list in Atlanta of the elites there and across the country. So maybe someone said, look, 
We want to end this murders. We want to end this crime. But we don't want to expose these people because of blackmail or whatever's going on there. We can't afford to expose these people. Um, and then Wayne Williams is not going to, he's not going to say anything. Oh, no, 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 I didn't kill these kids. I just took, I just took child porn photos of them and distributed it across the country. That's the only thing I did. That's the only thing I was involved in. The clients must have killed the children, okay? I'm just fat, pudgy, little Wayne Williams. So the safe bet was to get him on the, chil- on, on the two adults, okay? Because then you don't have to put through discovery on all the interviews and witnesses and evidence, other evidence that they found on the children. You can just selectively put evidence about the fibers and making connections there. It's a possibility. Again, you're never going to know, like I've said before in my other videos, you're never going to know anything absolutely 100% about anything. But there definitely seems to be indications of this going on. Again, why wasn't Wayne Williams prosecuted for all the murders, all, the children especially. If they're going to call him the Atlanta child murderer, you think they would have convicted him on at least one of the child murders, okay? I'm not saying Wayne Williams is innocent. That's not what I'm saying at all. But it could be that they only convicted him on the two adults because something else is going on there. And you can easily see this network with John David Norman was going on 60s, 70s especially and then the 80s and for some reason, somehow, some way either the charges for molestation or abuse of child or sodomy got dropped or he served a very short time and then got out or fled on bail and no one ever ever tried to find him but here you have him in 1976. Even the FBI knows about him in 1976. But he continues all the way up until the 90s. Okay? <laughs> they know The FBI knows about the Odyssey Network. they got to know where he's at. Okay? Something is going on here that allowed John David Norman to get away with all this crap for years. So, again, like I said, we've established that there is and was a child exploitation, pedophilia, maybe even snuff film, uh, pornography type of industry that was going around. And then you got the prostitution ring with this Odyssey Foundation. So, definitely Wayne Williams has the ability to get that out there by using and exploiting these children. Also, what? He, uh, James Comento was arrested, supposedly, for having child pornography in his car. And James Comento was an associate of Wayne Williams with his Nova Entertainment. And again, it all comes back to the money. How the hell could Wayne Williams afford the studio time, afford the radio time, afford the printers, the gas, the food, all these things involved in this Nova Entertainment, but never produce a record, never put together the group, never tour them, never go to any clubs, never make any money. But we're supposed to believe that his elderly retired school teacher parents somehow forwarded the bill 500 to 1000 dollars a month back in 1979 1980 impossible take it what you will folks now what i'm going to do is i'm going to change this up a little bit 
I'm going to go back. My next personality one is going to be on Michael Thevis and his pornography ring, his empire out of Atlanta. But it was just right before Wayne Williams' day. About November 1978 was the last time he was out. But like I said, the remnants of his empire were still there in Atlanta. They were still auctioning off one of his studios that Wayne Williams actually was using to do these auditions um, all the way up until 1981. That was in, in an IRS auction there. So these networks, they pass in the night, they bump into each other, they know of each other, okay? There was young men being killed in Chicago by John Wayne Gacy. One of his employees, this Finsky guy, knew John David Norman. John David Norman was in contact with this guy in Houston that killed all those kids there. Why wouldn't Wayne Williams be in contact with John David Norman because John David Norman is next picked up in 1982 he disappears for a couple of years you see right here I'll show you where he pops up on the screen so you've got 1978 1979 March of 1979 he's in court here in March of 1980 but then he's not arrested again until 1982 and then again you also have this other pornography ring that all this came down right either right before Wayne Williams was arrested or right around the same time like like I said I think this one guy um, I'm a, I've got his name I'm gonna come across him um, was arrested for child pornography and was actually convicted on the same day that Wayne Williams was stopped on the bridge the 22nd so, anyway, we're going to keep moving along on this. I'm going to branch out a little bit. I don't want to get too, what do you call it, down in the mucky muck, okay? So, I've got some other topics that I wanted. I didn't realize that this topic would be so big um, with so many documents. So, I had some other topics that, I was thinking of to cover on this channel that I think I'm going to I'm going to cover them also. And one's about, one's lynchings. I've always wanted to go into a whole accounting and the history of lynchings and go over each lynching that occurred and the reasons why and the results of what happened after that, especially in Georgia. So I'm going to go after that one. Um, of course, I'm still doing my JFK assassination uh, videos not as much. I'm going to get into the RFK assassination. Also going to, because I'm moving back to Atlanta, and uh, I'm going to start doing some videos on the Martin Luther King assassination. Okay, A lot of people don't know this, that the person that, that killed Martin Luther King was also involved in pornography. He was a pornographer down in, um, that's how he made his money, down in Mexico. And uh, also, I've always been interested in blues music and its roots and how it started off. Um, I'm going to get involved in that. With the lynching videos, I'm also going to, once I get through all that, we're going to go back over a history of slavery and Jim Crow laws. And that will kind of give me a little bit of diversion. But, because um, you can really get, really down in this kind of depressed this why I stopped reading over the news articles because it was just the same thing over and over and over again it's very depressing and it's you know what do you call it uh, outrageous that even though the feds knew about him all these police agencies knew about him they didn't put this guy away for the rest of his life because as soon as he got out of prison he just kept doing the same exact thing again and again and again and again very, very frustrating. Anyway, 
I'm going to stop here. I'm going to pick back up again. Next one's going to be um, another FBI document. Again, I got got to go a little faster on those FBI documents because I got over 5,000 FBI documents on the Atlanta child murders. So we're going to go more into that whenever I may just skim through some of them. When I see witness statements, stuff like that, then I'll read those. Because it's like there's probably 100 pages on the FBI just trying to figure out and investigate the West Point Pepper Mill green carpet fibers. Fascinating for me because I like details, but very, very boring if you're listening. All right, so take care, and uh, we're going to keep just getting through this. And like I said, I could be completely off on this. It could just be that Wayne Williams just hated young black kids and decided to kill them. But then again, like I said, what's the whole point of this Nova Entertainment? He's not putting together an album, not putting together a group, and how's he able to afford it? This, I think the pornography angle, ties in to the other things we've been hearing and gives a means for him to make money. And this is why he has his studio, and this is why he never creates the group. Anyway, we'll get into this more, and... uh